These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. The year 1056 BCE likely passed much like any other year in Babylon and Asher. A king died, Asherbelkala of Assyria, but kings die pretty regularly, and he had been in charge for 18 years up to this point. Not a bad run, all things considered. He was said to have his son, Ereba Adad II, succeed him in a fairly orderly transition, and people likely didn't notice that anything was wrong. Well, they noticed that Aramean raids were pushing deeper and deeper into civilized territory each year. They noticed that the gods had withheld the rains and famine was stalking the land. They noticed that neighbors who had once been part of Assyria and Babylonia were increasingly striking out on their own, both hoping for the chance to defend themselves where the Mesopotamian powers were unable to, and to maybe plunder their neighbors for the sustenance that was no longer growing in their own fields. And if they were of a certain social class, they may have noticed that the last few decades had been a remarkable cultural achievement and that that was starting to dry up. But all these things are trends, progressing more or less slowly in fits and starts, the sort of thing an old man looks back on and sees across the arc of his life. But when they're living in it, these are just the way things are. 1056 BCE, by contrast, is a bookmark, a date picked by later historians on the basis of pretty much nothing but the death of Ashurbelkala to designate the start of the Mesopotamian Dark Age. And this age is about as dark as it gets. There's so little left to history that before this episode is over, we will have already found ourselves in 935 BCE. 120 years will have passed, and we'll be left with a very interesting question I got from a listener just as I was starting to really dig into this era for my preliminary research. With so little data for this period in the historical record, how can we be sure that it was actually 120 years that passed and not some lesser or perhaps even some greater amount of time? But before we get into a fun little discussion about the hows and whys of dating, that would be in terms of chronology, not romance, I'd like to look at what we do know about this extremely quiet 120 years of history. And while this is not the first Dark Age in Mesopotamian history, I can assure you that it will in fact be the last. On the other side of this is a comparative flood of data about the lives of kings, the lives of ordinary people, and the construction and warfare that they got up to. But for this Dark Age, perhaps the best way to give you a sense of how sparse it is would be to just list off everything of historical significance that's been recovered from this age. Focusing first on Assyria, we open with Ereba Adad II, about whom we do know a little bit. Apparently, when he took the throne, there was a bit of a succession crisis. No details are known, but Ashurbelkala's brother, Ereba Adad's uncle, went down to Babylon to seek shelter and plot for the throne. While this uncle was off plotting, Ereba Adad was able to claim some important religious victories, rebuilding a significant portion of Asher's temple, which is probably something I should dedicate an episode to because Though we often compare the god Asher to all the other gods, he's actually a little bit unique in that he was actually a specific mountain in the city of Asher, and so his cult statue was never carried away with the same effect as the abductions of Marduk, because, I mean, who's going to steal a mountain? Anyway, Ereba Adad didn't last for long, because his uncle popped in after two short years and knocked him off the throne. His uncle, named Shamsi Adad after the great conqueror 700 years previous, did not live up to his namesake, repairing a temple of Ishtar in Nineveh before dying three years later. He was succeeded in turn by a fellow named Asher Nasserpal, another Hebrew name, the original would be Asher Nasir Apli, but this guy is among the most baffling at all, 
It isn't clear at all if he should actually be Asher Nasser Paul II or the first. Convention calls him the first, but there may have been an earlier one who ruled very briefly after Tukulti Ninurta way back a few centuries ago. And then there's another Asher Nasser Paul II a few centuries later, and there's no good way to tell any of the inscriptions for this particular Asher Nasser Paul, apart from the more famous later one. Over 19 years of rule, about all we can say for this guy is that things were not going well, and the famine and Aramean invasions likely did no one any favors. I mean, did the Arameans some favors, probably, as long as they were invading successfully, but now he's followed up by a fellow named Shalmaneser II, who, despite ruling for another 11 years, appears to have accomplished absolutely nothing which lasted. I'm sure he did stuff for 11 years, but we don't know about it. His one surviving inscription still claims the title of King of the Universe, but makes no mention of the fact that he was probably getting absolutely stomped by desert nomads his entire life. Then he dies, and we get two kings, one right after another, first called Asher Nirari IV and Asher Rabi II. Of the reigns of these two kings, all we have is one kingly monument, which we assume must belong to one of them, because it's sort of situated there in our dig of Asher, in a line of kings, and right before it is Shalmaneser, and right after it is Asheresh Ishi the third. so logically there should be two monuments, one to each of these kings, but for some reasons one of these guys is so useless that he didn't even get the customary kingly monument in the center of the city. And the monument we do have is so worn away that we can't read who it's supposed to be for. The two of them ruled for a combined 46 years and did nothing to avert famine or Aramean warriors or apparently even merit two individual statues. Asher Resh Ishi, taking the throne after these two nobodies, does not seem to be any more accomplished than his forefathers, but at least he got two of his inscriptions to survive the ages. One of them says nothing more than the fact that he was king of the entire world, and another in a very interesting inscription from a vassal all the way out on the Khabar River in modern eastern Syria suggests that while Assyrian power has very much waned, there were still cities relatively far out who were, for whatever reason, still finding it advantageous to associate themselves with Asher. Actually, that minor vassal, a fellow named Bel Erish, seems to be more accomplished than any of the Assyrian kings at the time, managing to muster perhaps 3,000 men to rebuild the temples, walls, and canals, which had apparently fallen into complete ruin in his territory by this point. It's possible he's inflating that number to sound bigger than he is, and the awful state of these projects before Bel Erish started working on them is more indicative of hard times than his little recovery project is of good times. I should mention that even though this guy went way out west, is at least somehow associated with the Assyrians, we have a pretty good idea that much of the Middle Euphrates, the area between the Khabar and Assyria proper, had been overrun by Arameans, and the Assyrian heartland, the area around Asher and Nineveh itself, is being raided pretty regularly, and areas further out are simply beyond the reach of the king's armies. Which is the situation we f find the Assyrians in as Tiglath-Pileser II takes the throne. What does this king do to turn things around? As far as we can tell, nothing at all, and his eleven or so years passes in near silence. His kingly monument, though, either neglects to call him the king of the universe, or maybe the part where he's made that com now completely hollow claim has worn away. And finally, with the death of Tiglath-Pileser II, 
the Dark Age ends. The Neo-Assyrian period begins, and Asher Dan II rises from the ruins to build the foundation of what will become a great and powerful empire in the year 935 BCE. And that might be a record on the show, 120 years in uh, 10 minutes, but we're not going to talk about Asher Dan today, and in fact, we probably won't start his story for a fair few episodes, because the Neo-Assyrian story is one we're going to save for later. For now, let's hop down south for a story that's going to sound very similar to the one in the north, except with even more names, because the kings kill each other a lot faster. I hope you're writing this down, because there will be a test on all of the king names that you hear today. No, that's... That's actually not true. Uh, today, there's a ton of names flying past, and I think most of you listening don't hold on too hard to any of these personal names, which is very reasonable. Most of the people that you've heard about today, you don't need to remember their names too hard, uh, especially today. These guys are so obscure. There's not actually going to be a test. Who came after the Asher Nasrpal of the Assyrian Dark Age? I, I've i already forgotten it. I just told you his name a couple minutes ago. Who cares? I looked it up. The answer is Shalmaneser, but I'm honestly, I'm going to forget that as soon as I'm not looking directly at my notes anymore. Anyway, Babylon in this same period is a bit of an interesting case because it's clearly much less able to defend itself, generally speaking. And there are numerous times when the city of Babylon itself will starve so hard that there will be no food offerings for the gods for multiple years at a time. Despite this, however, we actually have more sources for them from this period. The instability itself led people to carve large kudaru stones, which are large rocks with legal agreements, land holdings, or contracts inscribed on them, which were intended to last and remain binding even as governments and community records came and went. The many temples of Babylonia recorded histories, and during the later Neo-Babylonian period, they just seem to have written more chronicles about this period than the Assyrians did. Generally speaking, when the Assyrians aren't winning, they don't like to talk about anything. But the Babylonians are much more focused on religious matters than they are on military victories, and those remain a lot more constant no matter how much territory is being won or how much blood is being spilled. Now, 1056 BCE is not such a watershed year over in Babylon, but that's fine because they're not significant enough to affect historical epochs at the moment. Adad Atpla Idna, there's another name that won't be on the test, will be king in Babylon for another decade or more and have enough time to support the Assyrian usurper Shamsi Adad before he himself passes away. He is replaced by Marduk Ahe Ereba, who survives on the throne only six months or so, so briefly that he doesn't even get a regnal year to himself. He, in turn, is followed by a guy named Marduk Zer something, a guy so poorly attested that we don't even know the last section of his name. To rule for 12 years and leave so little mark is remarkable among Babylonian rulers. But it's likely that he ruled over a Babylon suffering the same famines and Aramean invasions that the Assyrians were struggling under. After that, a guy named Nabu Shumalibur took the throne as the final king of the Isan dynasty. A later chronicle of religious observances remembers this as a time of political instability, where the city of Babylon could not effectively hold on to territory beyond the city itself. We don't actually know how Nabu Shumalibur died, or why his death meant the end of the dynasty, but the two speculations are that the Aramean incursions in northern Babylonia were so severe that the city of Babylon was no longer viable as a capital for the time, or that the Isan dynasty had performed so poorly that the Assyrians, who despite their own hardships were still the superior Mesopotamian power, not so gently encouraged one of the other power centers to take over. Now, coming up from the south, 
was a fellow named Simbar Shipak, called a noble warrior of the Sea Land, and appears and takes over. He appears to have been mostly a military man, which was probably what was needed in times of constant invasion, instead of a noble from some distinguished lineage, though he does claim succession from the kings of the first Sealand dynasty. This, by the way, is the start of the second Sealand dynasty, and we've seen some indications that the people of the South had preserved a somewhat romantic memory of how well that first Sealand dynasty had gone. And so it makes sense for him to trade off that memory, and with an ancestor so distant, who's to say that there isn't an actual lineal connection? I mean, who knows? Now, for the last long while, most of the region that we once knew as Proud Sumer has turned into just empty desert as the sea level changes of the Persian Gulf and the coastline and waterway shifts have left the land high and dry. Especially in the south, the rivers have shifted away from the once great cities, leaving Eridu, Ur, Lagash, and others little more than relic cities when they're still inhabited at all. The northern line of cities, Nippur and Isin and the like, are still in good shape, relatively speaking, but south of that the land is pretty uniformly poor and thinly populated. Most interesting, though, is that past this salt desert of dead cities, as the Persian Gulf has receded, it has created more land, and wherever there's more land, there'll be people filtering in to fill that land. Or perhaps more accurately, as the northern swamps dried up, the swamp people moved south to fill the newly created swamps. For that's what this land was, a bunch of swamp, created as if by magic from the sea. And it isn't clear how aware the ancient people were that this was newly created land. It would have been a very slow process, hard to see from generation to generation even, but they did have written records of Eridu and other cities being coastal towns. Anyway, even though it was new land, it was a miserable swamp, and where the swamp receded was miserable desert. New land may have been a miracle of the gods, but it was not the most beautiful and glorious of miracles. And yet that very unattractiveness may have been Simbar Shipak's power base. The land, which was once called Sumer, and now known to most as Sea Land, may have avoided the famine by not being so dependent on agriculture, just because you can't grow anything in a desert and a swamp, and may have avoided the pillaging Aramaeans by being a miserable fetid swamp that even the barbarians don't care to visit too often. And we often assume that not too much was going on in Sea Land because the region leaves us basically no records, but these times of sea land domination are probably much more poorly recorded than other periods of history, simply because these swamps, they're going to eat your clay tablets a lot faster than the deserts of the rest of the Near East will. So they could have written, for all we know, even more, but it would have decayed yet faster. And so Simbar Shipak gets slid past with the rest of the Dark Age, even though it's possible that something really interesting happened here. Scraps of records record that a bit of construction was done on some temples, and he was able to afford some luxury items like a fancy chair, and he was recognized pretty far north, close to or perhaps inside of what was often considered the Babylonian Assyrian border region. On the other hand, the later religious chronicles remember this as a time when floods ravaged the fields, and the cities were so sparse that wild animals entered freely and attacked people. Imagine a bear in the middle of your local major city, just wandering in, and you could get a sense of just how miserable things were. I guess that sort of happened in COVID. I don't know. This more bleak picture may reflect primarily the experience up north, further from sea land and under more regular Aramean attack, or it may reflect a general sense of things. We don't really have any clear idea. 
He ruled for 18 years and seems to have had about as good a grip on things as anybody in this chaotic period, right up until the day when he was assassinated by a rival faction claiming kingship, indicating that for all that he was a stabilizing force, things weren't actually stable. Ea Mukin Zeri was apparently widely despised by history and his contemporaries, and after five months he was in turn murdered, buried without honors in a swamp, and replaced by someone else, a Kashushu Nadin Ahe. This king died after only three years, though not because he was widely hated, and while we don't know what he actually did, he, we know he was buried in a palace like Simbar Shepak had been, a legitimate burial for a non-illegitimate king. And that was the end of what history would remember as the Second Sealand Dynasty. It would scarcely seem possible, but they managed to be even more obscure than the first to go by that name, though they likely ruled over more territory, being nominally rulers over a united-ish Babylonia. We honestly can't tell if they ruled from the city of Babylon or not. Perhaps they had a nominal administration up there. Perhaps the king lived properly in the city, or perhaps it was a fully secondary city for all of 21 years. Though there is reason to think that the city itself was a bit neglected for a bit. Part of that reason is that the next dynasty is called the Dynasty of Bazi, a group of kings hailing from a place even more obscure than the Sealand Dynasty. Eluma Shakin Shumi comes out of who knows where to take the throne. We know that a village called Bazu, somewhere on the Tigris River, uh, was there back during the Akkadian Empire over a thousand years ago, and we know that at some point there was a tribe called the Sons of Bazi, also along the Tigris River somewhere. And we really have no idea if either this village or this tribe has anything at all to do with the dynasty in question. Our first king, Elumash Shakin Shumi, was called a member of the tribe of Bazi, but there are enough spelling inconsistencies that it's hard to tell if this is just an alternate spelling of either of these places, or it's another place altogether. Anyway, wherever he came from, his main claim to fame is that he was able to restore the regular food offerings to some of the temples, indicating that at least they were not desperately starving while he was king. He made his palace in a place called Kar Marduk, a place which is only ever referenced in this dynasty, with no clear sense of where it is. From the name, it could be a palace expansion on the city of Babylon, which is the city of Mar Marduk, or it could have just been a palace town literally anywhere in Babylonia, or he could have renamed the city of Bazi, Kar Marduk, in honor of him being the king of Babylon. Who knows? He ruled for like 14 years, maybe 16 years, and then he died. His successor may have been his son, but who really knows? Ninurta Kuduri Usur was called a son of the House of Bazi, whatever that means, and ruled for maybe two or three years with nothing specific that's known. Then he died and was replaced by another son of House Bazi, Shirikti Shukamuna, a guy with a Kassite name for whatever reason, who ruled either three months or five months, then died, ending the line of Bazi in as much obscurity as it arose. The Bazi dynasty was replaced by the Elamite dynasty, with air quotes, quotes around both Elamite and dynasty. Mar Bidi Apla Oser has a holy Akkadian name, and he's described as being of Elamite descent, not an actual Elamite. This period of Elamite history, by the way, is much or more of a Dark Age as Mesopotamian history. So there's nothing over there that we can compare him to in this period. And as for dynasty, this king would rule for either 6 or 15 years and then be replaced by yet another dynasty. What did he do during that period? Who knows? Probably Elamite stuff. After Mar Bidi Apla Usur, 
this one-man dynasty came to a close, the next dynasty arose. It's called in the ancient sources the Dynasty of E. And it's really not clear why any of the ancient chroniclers thought that this should be reckoned as a unified dynasty. Unless, of course, they were as unclear on the details of what happened in this period as we are today. That, uh, may be a reference to the city of Babylon, indicating that whatever the family lineage, these were all men who came from the chief city. But we really can't say for sure that that's the case. Now, this dynasty was established, in as much as it was a dynasty at all, by a fellow named Nabu Mukin Apli, whose name means Nabu is the establisher of a legitimate heir. Now, this is going to be one of the defining marks of the uh, dynasty, that a ton of them take the god Nabu in their name, and the rest all take Marduk in their name. Nabu, in this period, is really gaining prov prominence as a divinity. He's the son of Marduk, which gives him extra points in Babylon, but most interestingly, he's the god of writing. Now, traditionally, up to this point in the show, Nisaba, goddess of grain, has been considered the goddess of writing. But gradually, Nabu has come to be identified as the god of and inventor of writing. And he's much more focused directly on literacy and scribal endeavors than the grain goddess was. The fact that the Babylonians have come through this miserable dark age even more focused on a god of literacy and creative endeavors is actually pretty remarkable and probably testifies to the strength of the scribal culture even in this period when we can't actually attest to much of it at all. Of course, all this will pay off at the end of the show, in the great flowering of the Neo-Babylonians, and I'll finally be able to set aside whole episodes to mathematics, astrology, medicine, and the myriad other sciences of mighty Babylon. But the seeds have been planted a long time ago, and are being nurtured generation after patient generation. Anyway, Nabu Mukin Apli rules for 36 years, and of those, 11 years are so bad that they have to completely cancel the New Year's festival for fear of Aramean invasion and lack of food. He shows up in a few legal documents, mostly indirectly, but he does quite little that's been remembered over 3,000 years. He died right around 939, which you'll notice is only four short years before the cutoff for today's episode. He's succeeded by his son, who rules for only eight months, though we have no idea why he died so quickly, and another of Nabu Mukin Apli's sons takes over, Marbidi Ahe Idna, meaning, The god Marbidi has given me brothers. He ruled, according to most sources, from the year 939 BCE to the year question mark BCE. That's right, the northern Assyrians may be emerging from a dark age, but the Babylonians are sinking ever deeper into obscurity, to the point that for several centuries we're going to be unable to construct a coherent king's list for the southern city. All of which, one way or another, brings us to 935 BCE, and to the end of our 120 years of darkness for Mesopotamia. I am a little bit surprised that I was able to fill this much of the episode when most dedicated histories cap out around a page or two for this century, but I probably shouldn't have underestimated my ability to babble about nothing for endless periods. Anyway, I want to close out today's show by addressing a listener question that was asked a long time ago now. I gave that listener a short answer and said a longer explanation would be coming, but then it took a lot of episodes to get to this point in the show. Apologies for that. Sometimes I'm more prompt than other times. Anyway, the question is this. There are some people who believe that this entire 120-year Dark Age is either exaggerated in length or simply didn't happen. Now, these people are not the leading scholars in the field, and some of them come off, let's be honest, as crazy people, trying to push various convoluted chronologies, uh, often to advance some Bible theory, 
Or in other chronological issues, they're trying to push various conspiracy theories or ancient aliens theories. But at the same time, ancient history, and particularly history from ancient Mesopotamia, which is about as ancient as you get, really does have genuine chronological disputes, some of which can misplace a century on one end or the other. And so, rather than talk about any one particular idea of alternative chronology, let's really examine how we come up with the dates and lengths that we put forward in this show and in history more generally. This era, as we've just seen, is posited to be over a century long, yet with very little to show from it. Why is it that we say it runs from just 1056 to 935? Why not shorter? Indeed, why not longer? The answer is that ancient chronology, that is, assigning dates in the modern calendar system to things that happened in the ancient past, is a vast and challenging puzzle. From assorted, often fragmentary shards of clay, historians have done a remarkable job over the last century building a fairly robust picture of the order and timing of events thousands of years ago. The evidence, generally speaking, can be broken into three different parts. The internal chronological evidence, the cross-cultural correspondences, and the objective reference. Now, the most common sort of reference is internal evidence. If a document tells us that King A was succeeded by King B, then we know how these two kings go together. If a document tells us that King A ruled for 16 years, then King B ruled for 8 years, then that gives us even more information. If we had a full list of Mesopotamian kings written in the reign of each king, going from the beginning to the end of Mesopotamian history, then chronology would be relatively simple. And indeed, we do have a number of king's lists that purport to do this very thing, which really helps to solidify a lot of the chronology that we work with on this show. However, looking at king's lists specifically, we know they have a few problems. The most obvious is that we don't have all the pieces, and I mean that quite literally. Most of the king's lists that we have have big chunks missing out of them. And while sometimes we can guess how many ge generations might be represented from a whole, you know, based on how many names long it is, we've seen often that there's no consistent reign length for a king, ancient or otherwise. Some last for 30 years, while others last for mere months. This means that we're putting together a puzzle that we know going in is simply missing pieces. Perhaps more importantly, though, with the king's lists, we know that we can't trust them in a way that we might trust a modern listing of dates for something like U.S. presidents. Each list is written during a certain period of time, and though we assume that they're working off of ancient documents just the same way we're working off of ancient documents, it's pretty clear that the further back in time they go, the less reliable they are. This isn't just a question of the mythical super early kings who the king's lists claim ruled sometimes for hundreds of millions of years. The writers of the king's lists were working with certain cultural assumptions about how kings and dynasties passed through the years, with one following directly after the other. But in periods of dynastic chaos or regnal instability, it seems that there were times when two kings might claim the throne simultaneously, ruling in different areas, or when the throne may have been vacant for a period of time. These periods are simply glossed over in King's List, and they introduce errors when taken literally. Now, fortunately, the King's Lists are not the only puzzle pieces we have to work with. A good portion of the documents that we have to work with are dated to a certain king's reign, and sometimes to a certain year within that king's reign. Uh, if we can connect two documents with different year formulas together, for, for example, a document announcing the beginning of a legal case, and another document from a different year that announces the conclusion of that same legal case, well, then we can be fairly certain the order of everything associated with those documents 
follows the order of the documents themselves. After all, the scribes may be fuzzy on details that happened centuries ago, but most legal documents are pretty careful to get the current year right. Now, internal chronological evidence like this gets us pretty far in the well-documented pieces. And for kings like Hammurabi or the later Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian kings, we have almost a surplus of puzzle pieces. But Mesopotamian history is littered both with dark ages and, let's say, dim ages. Not so dark periods, but where it's tough to match the internal evidence as robustly as we might like. After all, how many times have I been able to put kings in sequence on this show, but then said that I don't actually know the order of events in the reign? And sometimes I just do it without telling you I'm doing it. I'm just sort of guessing based on what seems reasonable. Often, especially on this show, events within a king's reign are ordered more or less on what seems to be a reasonable sequence, rather than any objective chronological evidence. Fortunately, we can often supplement the internal evidence with cross-cultural correspondences. For instance, if a certain king in Babylon wrote a letter to a certain pharaoh over in Egypt, then we can be pretty sure that those two kings at least lived during the same time. The extensive diplomatic contacts of the late Bronze Age were pretty remarkable in giving us these sorts of correspondences, and allowed us to build a really strong chronology, not just for a particular region, but for the whole Near East um, considered as a whole. The breakdown of that international order is part of the problem with this period. We don't really hear about the Assyrians or Babylonians interacting with anyone outside of their river system. And so we can't compare our evidence to the evidence of, say, the Egyptians or anyone else with a written history. Now, just internal evidence and cross-cultural comparisons can get us pretty far. In fact, for more modern history, that's mostly all we use. There's enough cross-cultural comparisons that we can peg nearly anyone in the last five centuries to the correct date in the modern calendar system, assuming we know the date in whatever local system we're looking at. The problem with these all comes when there are dark periods, when all of our evidences go dark. How are we supposed to know how long a dark age lasts? Archaeology can give us general guesses when nothing else is available, but archaeology is always a bit fuzzy when you get down to individual years rather than decades and centuries. Fortunately, in some cases, we do have a third class of evidence, references to objectively datable events. Now, these are rare, but when we can find them, they're like the corner pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, around which our whole chronology can be anchored. And indeed, it's the uncertainties in these very objective references that create our biggest uncertainties. For example, the entire Late and Middle Bronze Age in Mesopotamia is pegged principally to a single astronomical reference in the year 1638 BCE. Now, we mentioned this briefly back when we were in 1638, but these are the Venus tablets of Ami Saduka. Now, this tablet contains a set of remarkably detailed observations of the planet Venus, which occurred, the tablet tells us, in the eighth year of the Babylonian king Ami Saduka, great-grandson of Hammurabi. Now, if we know that the 8th year of Ami Saduka's reign was 1638, then we know he took the throne in the year 1646. Remember, the years go backwards in BCE. If we know his father, Amaditana, ruled for 37 years, then his father took the throne in 1683. And in like fashion, we can continue either up with other kings or down with later kings. Most references will take us to Hammurabi around 1750, and a lot of the stuff Hammurabi did can be dated to a particular year of Rimsin, or of Zimri Lim, or of Shamsi Adad. And from there we can trace out the lines of Larsa, and Mari, and the northern territories, all respectively, 
filling out the puzzle with the internal evidences and confirming it with further cross-references. For example, if Samsu Ilona in the next generation had a correspondence with another Assyrian king that we can date to somewhere in that king's reign. Now see, from that single fixed peg, we can date the entire Middle Bronze Age and supplement our dating of the Late Bronze Age. And there are some other similar astronomical events in Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon for the Late Bronze Age and Iron Age, as well as some in the Early Bronze Age that allow us to peg the chronology webs that we build from internal and cross-references as well. Some of you may remember that I have mentioned in the past that there are legitimate disagreements about where things belong in the Bronze Age timeline. For the Middle Bronze Age in particular, that period pegged by the Venus tablets of Ami Saduka, there's a persistent debate centered around the fact that those Venus tablets are not as singular and definitive that we might, as we might like. The Middle Chronology, which is the one I've been using on the show, is based off thinking that the particular patterns of Venus obs observed there reflect the year 1638 BCE. And with modern computer simulations, you can, like I said, go back in time and see what the whole pattern of the stars in the sky would have looked like for any day in the past 10,000 years and forward in the future 10,000 years more. Scientists have apparently predicted down to the minute the time and location of every solar eclipse for the next whatever thousands of years it's all basic physics run through massive computers. It's really cool. There's even a website for it. If I see it, if I can find it, I don't remember where it is. I'll put in the show notes if I can find it. But those tablets themselves are not computer-assisted, laser-guided observations. There are details which are a bit fuzzy, which could perhaps fit another year. And Venus has this eight-year cycle as well as a 56-year cycle. Add all of those uncertainties together, and there are, in fact, a number of candidate years which the Venus tablets could be reflecting. Then you add in the uncertainties in the web of connections between internal evidences. Sometimes we don't actually know for sure how many years a king ruled. Sometimes chroniclers from Babylon they might have gotten confused about which Assyrian king or Egyptian pharaoh is in charge in some particular event. Sometimes scribes just garble stuff, the ancient equivalent of typos. For the Bronze Age, this all adds up to a tremendous amount of uncertainty. For the Iron Age, however, especially the Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian empires that we get to at the back end of this Dark Age, we have a lot more astronomical observations, a lot more solar eclipses, a lot more correspondence between rulers, and a lot more explicitly historical writing than any point previous. And perhaps more importantly, the end of Babylon runs up to the expansion of the Persian Empire, which itself runs up against the Greeks, and we know a lot about the Greeks. We can take parallel dates from Greece to date pretty much all the late period stuff. We can run backwards from Alexander the Great, who pretty definitely died in 323 BCE, and in multiple different ways we can anchor our web of chronology to a large enough number of points that we're no longer worrying about decades and start haggling over individual years, and that's just for the relatively obscure events. It's because of the strength of this chronological chain that we can say pretty solidly that Ashurdan II comes to the throne of Assyria in 935 BCE, which becomes our cutoff date for the Dark Age. Similarly, though the Bronze Age collapse has made things a bit, shall we say, rough in our dating, and indeed our beginning date of 1056 is a bit uncertain, the Late Bronze Age saw the great Amarna period, a time of unprecedentedly preserved correspondence between great powers that lets us anchor the events of the Kassite period quite well. 
and the connection from the Kassites to the Isin dynasty is strong enough that the only real chronological debate is whether the Isin kings took over a few years before, a few years after, or immediately following the fall of the last Kassite king. And all of that puts us less than 10 years off in either direction for the start of the Dark Age. All of this is to say that this is the reason we know how long this Dark Age lasted, even though we know very little about the Dark Age itself. We know very solidly when it ended, or I mean at least when Asher Dan II took over, which we semi-arbitrarily mark as the end date. And we know, too, within a decade when it started. We could well be a few years off, especially with the start, but the general idea of approximately 12 decades of hard times is pretty clearly painted in the chronology. Now, hopefully, all that gives you a better sense of what was going on in the final century of the Middle Assyrian and Middle Babylonian periods, and gives you a better sense of where all these dates are coming from over the whole show. Now, we should introduce the Neo-Assyrian Empire, but we're not going to, not yet. Indeed, we may not actually get to the Neo-Assyrians for the rest of the year. In fact, I can pretty much guarantee it. Um, instead, next episode, we're going to talk about animals. We're going to talk about farm animals, sacred animals, wild animals anything else that looks fun. This was a listener request a number of months ago, and as soon as I got the email, I was certain I would do a whole episode about it, because I like animals. And after that, we're going to go west to visit our Hittite friends, or at least what's left of them. And in pretty much just one episode, we're going to summarize all of the early Neo-Hittite developments, because their chronology is an absolute miserable mess. And then we're going to talk about Israel. So join us next time for the Mesopotamian version of Old McDonald's, as we learn what sounds all the different farm animals make in a bunch of dead languages, if I can figure that out. Thank you for listening. <laughs>